God be the glory. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you that we could be here this night. 
to study your word and we pray for forgiveness of our sin that you might hear this prayer that we offer to you we're here to praise you and honor you worship you as the one true and living God we thank you God for those who have been sick and are now well for those that have been mentioned and that are sick and we pray Lord your healing hand would be on them and help them to to get well that they can be back with us we pray Lord that you will open our hearts and minds to your word especially in this hour that we might open this book and study your word and use it to further your kingdom. We pray, Lord, for strength to grow in our faith. We need to grow in our faith, Lord. We have troubling times in this nation and we have evil people trying to destroy it. We pray, Lord, that you give us the strength and the fortitude to withstand these evil things when they are put in front of us and to rightly handle your word that we can confront these things. We pray especially for people in law enforcement that seem to be under attack every day. We pray, Lord, that you bless them and watch over them. We pray for those people who have been left over there in Afghanistan, for the ones who, who are true Christian, for the ones who profess to be Christian and call on your name, as Christ said, if they are for us, they won't be against us. I pray, Lord, that you would help those people and give them strength. Not just there, but Christians all over the world who are being attacked for their belief in you, Lord Jesus. I pray that you would give them strength and give us the strength to Help them whenever we have opportunity. We pray for this nation, Lord, that if it would be in your heart to be merciful and save it, we pray, Lord, that you give all of us the strength to stand up and not tolerate the evil things that are being forced on our children enforced on all people who profess your name and we pray that you would just give us guidance each day that we might do the right thing and that you would be forgiving and merciful we thank you Lord Jesus for your sacrifice loving God loving us and being completely obedient you came to this earth to be a salvation for all of us. We pray, Lord, that you'll give us strength to stay faithful, grow in our faith, love you more, and to love each other more each day. Again, we pray for forgiveness of our sins. We pray this prayer in your most holy name. Amen. And I did not mention the men's breakfast. That is still on in the morning, 8 o'clock. At whose house? At Travis's, okay. Make sure I get the right house for everybody to start knocking on the door at, at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, but the men are all invite, invited, but let, I guess you would love to have a number for sure tonight, right? Okay. Probably would like to have a number a day or two ago. But anyway, um, if the, the men are all invited to a breakfast in the morning at um, 
Travis Arbor at your house. And if you have not let him know, let him know that you're planning on being there if you are. So 8 o'clock in the morning, look forward to that. Sorry I didn't mention that a moment ago. Last week um, I mentioned that we, were, we finished, I think, James chapter 2, and we'll take up with chapter 3 this week, and I had that in my mind, and prepared the slides for chapter 3, and then a little while ago I was looking at it, and I go, you know, we didn't finish chapter 2. There, there's a whole section on faith and works in there that might be a little important to look at. So, um, re and um, rather than skipping over to chapter 3 and then coming back to 2, uh, I thought we'd go ahead and just look at the end of James chapter 2. I don't have slides on those, uh, th we can, but if you have a book you can follow along. I'll call out the questions, but just turn in your Bible to James chapter 2, and that's where we'll spend our time um, looking at the last part of that because it deals with um, faith and works. Uh, you know, in, in years gone by, there's a lot of, a number of folks that have looked at the book of James and just have discounted the inspiration of the book of James because they said they didn't agree with what it said about faith and works and how they work together. So rather than saying, hey, it's a part of scripture and I need to do what it says, some have just kind of thrown it out. But um, I, I think many people have a misunderstanding about what the Bible means when it says faith, about what the Bible means when it says works, and, and we'll notice some of those questions as we get into the lesson this evening. Any questions or comments before we start with James 2, verse 14? It says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? And that's what the first question on lesson four was, of what profit is faith without works and why? What does it profit if a person says, I have faith, but I don't have works? Can faith save him? Kind of like, it, it's exactly like heaven. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a dead faith. And, and I mean, we go, we're not, we go. It's very hard to have real good faith and no works. Why is that? First of all, you wouldn't come to worship. Okay. Right, and that's a broad word. Works. I mean, I think people limit works to just certain, like baptism, for instance. That that's one they'll put. Repent. I've mentioned many times. Repentance takes a lot more work than baptism does. I mean, baptism is a submission to being buried and raised back up. Um, you know, you may have to kind of stand up a little bit, but otherwise, I mean, it's it's more of a submissive. You think about like what you're talking about. It takes effort to maybe get yourself ready or to, or to come and then the singing and the praying and the Lord's Supper and then you think about repentance in our life and the changes I mean the effort that goes forth maybe breaking bad habits or starting good habits uh, but if you just have faith alone boy it rules out just about really everything doesn't it? why else would a person that has faith have works. Why is it so hard to separate those two if you have true faith? Okay, faith is defined by your works. Okay. What else is being said? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a walk that we're supposed to walk, a life that we're supposed to live, um, things that we're supposed to do. But, you know, you think about it. If I truly believe not just in the existence of Jesus or just the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, if I truly believe Jesus, then if I truly believe what he says, I'm going to do what he says if I truly believe it. If I truly believe heaven's real and hell's real, if I truly believe... You know, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish, for instance. Or Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father but by me. If I truly believe the Great Commission, if I really believe it, I'm going to respond to it and obey it, aren't I? I mean, if you don't respond to it, you really don't believe it. False profession? Okay. Yeah. 
Have you ever had somebody tell you, oh, I believe you? Like when you say something, they say, oh, I believe you, and you know good and well they don't believe. You know, you, you, you see something or witness something or, um, you, you know, uh, or, you know, you're, you're saying, I did this or I didn't do that, and, and you could tell the person does, they, oh, I believe you. And you know they don't, and it's just frustrating. But it's different when someone really believes you. And, I mean, sometimes we can be that way with the Lord. I mean, you know, I think there's a lot of people that can read what it talks about judgment, and they somehow I think they think they can talk their way out of it on judgment day or talk their way into heaven or whatever it may be. Of course, that's talking. That's a work too, isn't it? But anyway, whatever. But, I mean, see, see how you can get into the, the little... But a lot of folks want to profess a faith Maybe without it costing them anything, or maybe it's, maybe it is because it has been so instilled into so many people that you don't have to do anything. That there's no, you know, it has to be separate. Why do you think it is that that has been taught so strongly that it's faith alone? Why the emphasis against works? What ignorance? Okay. Just ignorance of the truth? Why, why is it that, it seems like you, you listen to many people in the religious world, most of them, if you pin them down, they'll say that it's faith alone that saves you. I mean, you know, like in other words, works does not play a part at all in anything with salvation. And because they'll try to say you're earning it. Why is that so ingrained into the religious mindset of so many today? Okay. Okay, some of it could just be because it's a lot easier. Okay. That's what people do. It don't work. Okay. I think that that's a lot of reason why a lot of people, I think, receive that message because it is a lot easier. Okay. Yeah, you know, you go back to when... A lot of that got, was prevalent or began to be t taught. I mean, you have some of the religious group, I think, you know, like with the Catholic Church, there was really a strong emphasis on works. And, um, or, you know, you even had things like at one point when it got to the point of in selling indulgences where you could kind of pay for your sin ahead of time, or you do this work or that work or the, uh, you know, different things that you do to kind of pay for your sin or to, to make up for your sin, and um, I think people began to look at a lot of that and said, hey, some of this is, is, is not right, it, it's corrupt. And in answer to that, where that's over here, they swung way over here and just threw anything out that, that's required. I mean, you kind of went to the other extreme, and maybe that's an oversimplification, but I do think you see some of that. But like Billy said, I, I think it's a convenient thing as well, or maybe a lazy thing for some. But uh, but if you begin to read this, in like um, what was it, I said a moment ago as well, by Freddie, uh, it, it's ignorance. I mean, where they may, just hadn't really sat down and read it and understood it. But the bottom line is, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has works but does not have faith, can work save him? And that's a rhetorical question. No, I mean, by itself it cannot. And, and he gives an example um, here. <clears throat> if a brother or sister is naked, and destitute of daily food. And one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? What good does it do? You know, here, here's somebody who has some need and you could fill it in with other, th other things as well. I mean, we may just say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm praying for you. And, and it's good to pray for people, don't get me, don't get me wrong. But sometimes, there, may, there has to be some feet placed on those prayers and there's things that we can do for people and, and we're blessed to have a congregation that loves, uh, loves one another and, and does for one another. But you can get the picture of here's someone that is in true need and we just say, hey, I hope you're warmed and filled and we go on our way. Have we done anything to help them? No, it doesn't profit them anything by just our wishful thinking in this regard, not even a prayer, just saying, hey, be warmed and filled. I mean, but it doesn't do them any good and he says, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And, and question number two, why is faith without works dead? 
Why is it called dead? It's a dead faith. Okay. Okay. It is what it is. Okay. Okay. There's, it, it's, it, it does no good. It, it does not accomplish anything. There's no. There's not souls being won as a result of it, our, including our soul if we're that way. Other thoughts of why it's called dead? Okay. Okay. I mean, it, it has not made any change in our life. Where's that time at from faith to faith? Um, you have the faith that's revealed here in the pages of God's word, but it says from faith here to faith within my heart. I mean, I, I've got to take this. It's the implanted word, and it produces faith within my heart, within my life, and it shows itself in the things we'll see in, chap in the next chapter, the things we say, but also as we see, as I've seen in the previous chapter in this one, the things that we do. It's, it's got to, if it takes root and takes hold, it's going to make a difference. Other thoughts? Okay. It's, it's kind of lonely there, isn't it? I mean, yeah. I mean, it, it, and I guess you said the opposite is true too. Works without faith. I mean, yeah. I mean, because there's a lot of people in the world that do good things and do good deeds and are and, and just um, you know would be there for you and help you and, and meet your physical needs or emotional needs, but they're not a Christian. That's works without faith. But then you have faith without works. I mean, like you say, they have, you have to have them hand in hand. It can't be alone. Other thoughts? Um, how is faith demonstrated by works? We've already discussed that a good little bit already. Um, you go down to verse 18, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. Can you show someone your faith without your works, really? Is there any way, Billy has touched on this a moment ago, is there any way to show your faith without works? I mean, even just saying it is, is really a, a work in and of itself, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I, I, it's kind of an interesting question. I mean, you should, I've always looked at it and just kind of, hmm, you know, show me your faith without your works. Show it to me. Okay, you know, you know, how do you show your faith without your works? And, and I mean, if a person is honest with that, they'll have to think about, well, you know, if they may say, well, you know, I, I was at worship service this Sunday. Well, that takes some effort and work. Uh, I took some groceries over to someone's house because they were destitute and in need. You know, I mean, how do you show your faith? I mean, I told someone about Christ. Well, again, that's, how can you separate it? I think that's the point being made here. Um, but he said, I'll show you my faith by my works. And it's not a bragging thing here. He's just saying, look, if you want to see my faith, you let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. That they may see what? Your good works. Why? They glorify Father, the Father. It, it's, they're seeing your faith, and they're seeing what a godly person is like or what it means to have faith in Jesus and it causes them to glorify the Father in heaven. And so, um, again, it, we, we show that. Other thoughts on that? Okay. I mean, I don't know how you can, can show someone that you have faith without some type of action or something on your part. Okay, what's going to be said of it? Someone? Okay. 
Yeah, if you, if you believe in Jesus and believe God's word and never even acknowledge it out loud, is there any profit to that at all? I mean, it's not, is it? Uh, it's not doing you really any good, but it's not doing anyone else any good. Um, what profit is there? What does it profit? You know, um, in your life, in the life of that destitute person that's being discussed here, in, in the light of those that we're supposed to be shining our light, I mean, in the grand scheme of things eternally, what does it profit? I think the idea is it doesn't. Other thoughts? And again, that contrast of showing without works, you can't do it, showing it by works. And then verse 19. Okay. Okay, so, but, right, um, that's, that's a good point, I mean, you, you look, we're letting our light shine, not to bring glory to ourselves, but to bring glory to God, but like you said, if we're not doing it, we're not, but what is talking about the, the believing wife could win an unbelieving husband by their Good work by their, by their manner of life. Yeah. It's the same kind of principle there. But yeah, people should be able to see it. And, um, you know, maybe they'll see where you're, maybe a change that's been made in your life when you became a Christian. Or um, I can remember growing up, um, me and the boy lived behind us. We, pl- we were good friends. And we got to play in one Sunday afternoon. And my mother called and said, Mark, it's time to get ready for church. You know, you get, you get, we're, we're about in. I mean, you're supposed to be ready and ready to go out the door and, and the boy's like just tell your mama you, that you don't want to go and I, I just I, mean, I was little I, mean, I just shocked me like I never heard, of, heard somebody say you didn't want to go and he just said he said my mama will be glad to watch us and I think she even came out and said that's fine if you want to stay you know I'll, you, can, you can stay here and play while they go and I wouldn't even ask my parents <laughs> that was just that just floored me because I mean I was nine ten years old and i met but but and that that boy it floored him that i chose going to church over playing in the yard and having a good time to him i mean his, he couldn't understand me and i couldn't understand him you know uh but that that has stuck with me for many many years now uh, but I, and i've met many many more people with that kind of attitude that he had but i think that was my first I may have been exposed to it before, that's my first awareness where it sunk in, like, whoa, not everybody looks at it quite the way we do. And, uh, and by the way, my family was always the first one there, the last ones to leave, and uh, my father was not a preacher. I mean, you know, but we got there early and stayed late for, for whatever reason. In fact, one congregation he went to, they, they, they um, get, wind up giving him a key. They said, you get here before all the rest of them, just turn everything, unlock everything, turn everything on when you get here, you know. Uh, but I mean that, and it doesn't matter if we're 30 minutes early or on time or whatever. You know, I mean, if we just get here on time, as long as we're coming, that's what, the good thing. But the point is, I mean, not everyone. Hopefully, that boy can think back to that and go, "I remember when he did that," and maybe it made a good, a, a good picture on him. Other thoughts? Um, again, showing our work, and like Jimmy said, it can win others. Uh, you believe there is one God. You do well. Oh, you believe in God? Sure. That's, that's wonderful to believe in one true God. The demons believe and tremble. So, I mean, you could even carry that further. Do the demons believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God? They do. I mean, they acknowledged Him. And they acknowledged His authority and His power. And, you know, they were begging not to be cast out on one, one occasion. And... Uh, not be cast back into the, the, the abyss or pit. I mean, they'd rather go into the pigs or whatever. Of course, that didn't turn out well for them either, but um, they acknowledged and submitted in that way. I mean, they, they, they realized his authority, but is it going to save them? It doesn't, does it? And that's the point. He said, you can have faith on some level. I mean, we can talk about this empty faith. It's a it's not a true, genuine faith or whatever, but I mean, you can have faith. 
in, in God. You can have faith in Jesus as a son of God, uh, faith that the Bible is God's word, and it can even cause you to tremble. But even the demons believe and tremble. Of course, can you say trembling is a work? <laughs> uh, but, I, but I mean, it's, you know, but he says, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Why do you think he brings the demons in as an example here? Out of all the things he can give for an example, why the demons? Just going to the extreme, isn't it? I mean, saying, look, can we all agree that the demons are lost? I mean, you can argue over demons and demonology and all the things about them. But he said, we all acknowledge what the end result's going to be for all of Satan and his, his minions and all. We, we understand that. You know, that it's no salvation there. But do they believe? Sure. Does Satan acknowledge, I mean, know that there is a one God and that Jesus is the Son of God? Yes. Is he going to be saved? No. And so, I mean, he said, we can agree on that. Well, let's carry it on down to us today. And now then he's going to uh, mention as well, uh, the question five is of what is Abraham an example? Why is he such a good example of that? And then it asks number six, does the teaching in this chapter on the justification of Abraham contradict what is taught concerning him in the fourth chapter of the book of Romans where it says he was not justified by works, but rather by faith? Let's notice what it says here. Was, um, this is verse 21 of chapter two. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. And then it mentions Rahab. Okay, Abraham, justified. You know, he's in that great chapter of faith, Hebrews chapter 11. And, that, and on every one of those examples there, by faith, he offered Isaac, or was willing to offer Isaac. I mean, you know, he went he, until he stopped. By faith, an, an ark was built. By faith, a, a sacrifice was made. By faith, spies were not justified by works. What's the difference? Was he or was he not? Or what? what? Any thoughts? Are they different kinds of works? Was he justified by the works of the law of Moses? He wasn't, was. I mean, and that's something you look at number number of places, like in, in Galatians 3, I um, mean, there were promises that were made to Abraham. Abraham lived before the law of Moses. He lived, I mean, he was told, a great nation's going to come through you, but they've got to serve 400 plus years in bondage before they got to Mount Sinai and received the commandments, before they, they received that covenant. And so, I mean, he said, you know, there's some, there was some obedient faith on the part of Abraham before the law of Moses was given with all its thou shalt and thou shalt nots and all, all the requirements of that. And so it wasn't the works of the law of Moses, of, of the Moses or that, you know, that, that covenant that he did, but it doesn't mean that he didn't have works. I mean, right. Well, he believed that God could raise him from the dead. I mean, he, I think in his mind, he, he knew his, in his mind, he had probably already sacrificed him a thousand times in his mind going up that mountain. But he truly believed in God enough that God was going to keep the promise of, of a nation coming through his boy who has not even married yet, didn't have children, that he realized, you know, if I sacrifice him, God's going to have to bring him back to life. Now, God had a different plan. He... Even when we don't fully comprehend why, um, or we can't always see, you know, I know God says do this, but how's it going to all work? I mean, you know, you, you look at Abraham. I mean, he left not knowing where he was going. He offered Isaac, not sure how it was going to all work out, other than he'd wind up with a son who would have a nation come through him. 
But the point is, it's not justified by the works of the law of Moses I mean, that was given. But, it, but there is works involved and, uh, before the law. And, and we have works today that are important. We're not earning anything. We're submit, I mean, Abraham, like you said, had a strong faith and he was submitting to God's will. And, and if we truly believe God, we'll do what he says. Other thoughts on that? Can you imagine Hebrews 11 without the, the action part on that? I mean, you list all these people and say, these are all men and women of great faith. There's nothing that we can say that they did, but they were people of great, you know, I mean, like you say, it, it expresses itself in that way. I mean, we, we talk about that with love, the same principle. How do you express love for someone? You, you can tell them, sure, but you show it in many different ways. And, and it's... Um, because you love and care for that person. In the same way, with faith, you express it by the things that you do. And he mentions Rahab as well here in verse 25. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? I mean, he's saying, you know, we understand that she did what she needed to do to hide them and to make sure that they were okay. She put her, really, faith in God. She believed in God and um, that these were men from God and, and God's people and and she um, showed that by the thing that she did. As the body without the spirit is dead, that's, you know, there's a, death is a separation. Faith without works is dead also. And so um, if we can understand that when that spirit leaves the body, the body's dead. It's just an empty vessel there. And it's just faith. Vessel. Uh, a lot of folks in the religious world misunderstand that salvation. And, you know, I mentioned this a number of times before. I, it, I got to think about that one day. I said, you know, you talk to people that aren't Christians, and a lot of them will say, well, you know, I'm a good person. I think I'm going to be okay. Basically, they're saying I'm going to be saved by my works. You know, I, I don't have to have faith, if you will. I mean, I, I'm just a good person. I believe I'm going to be saved. It's, it's all good. But then when a person becomes a Christian, they try to say, well, I'm saved by faith without work. You know, I don't have to do anything. You know, I'm, I'm saved. It's, it's funny how that kind of, one wants works without faith, the other one wants faith without works, and yet they don't understand that the two go hand in hand. I'm thankful that God loved us enough that he didn't just say, I love you, but he sent his son to die for us. And that Jesus loved us enough, he didn't just say, I love you, he, he, he put it into, into action in his life, and he became obedient unto death and and we need to love God enough that we put it in action have faith enough that we put it in action that um, we're obedient in life and even unto death any other comments yes there's too many scriptures that talk about going back into the world or or finish the course keep the faith um, don't go wallow in the mud again or whatever. I mean, there's too many that just say that, you know, you can fall from grace. But um, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll take up there next week, um, finish up Types and Lucians on Chapter 2, and then we will officially start with Chapter 3. But I appreciate the discussion. Let me see if I can get down the mic. Sure, we had a song there. <laughs> That's okay. I can't say anything. <clears throat> As we have been for the last few weeks, um, really, you know, month or two, been looking at the book of James and have continued with that tonight. In James chapter 4, it says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. What are your plans for tomorrow? 
You know, we, we talked about the men's breakfast in the morning, and um, you may have a, a whole lot of things that happen. Sometimes you can get your schedule made out, then somehow call and say, I need you to do this, I need you to do that. And, and before you know it, you have a lot of plans. What about the next day? What about this weekend? What about your plans for next week? Some of you might look at your planning book and say, boy, every single day, every single week, every single month, it's just kind of filled up and filled in. And we do schedule things and we do make plans. But he does make a point here. He says, we make all these plans. He says, you don't know what will happen tomorrow. We don't know what will happen. He says, your life is like a vapor that appears for a little time and vanishes away like the clouds or the fog early in the morning and then it burns off. The clouds kind of, the heat burns them away or uh, you know, a tea kettle and the steam kind of comes up strong and then vanishes away. He says, your life's like that vapor. It seems so strong and never ending, but then it does vanish. You know, even the longest of lives seems so brief. So what should we do? Should we stop planning? No. We plan and say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. We plan understanding that the world may not be here tomorrow. We may not be alive tomorrow or the next day. We plan with eternity in mind as well. Don't just plan thinking, you know, I, I can... I can make it till next week, next month, next year, 10 years, 20 years, I have a long life ahead of me or whatever else it may be. If the Lord wills, we shall live. If the Lord wills, we'll do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So what do we do? We make our plans, we live our lives, but we always think about eternity. We think about our relationship to God we understand that it may not be the Lord's will for us to, to live a long life or the Lord, it may be the Lord's will for him to come back in the next day or two or even today before the service is over tonight. So what else do we do? He closes out and says, Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it to him is sin. We have to do good. We have to do good. We talked about faith without works, or faith with works in class tonight. And we know the good things we should be doing. There, there's things that we should do as Christians to put our faith into action, to let our light shine, to, to take care of people, and you know, reach out to people with physical needs, emotional needs, most importantly with spiritual needs. We know to do good. And the best thing you can do if you're not a Christian right now it's to not only say, I believe in Jesus as the Son of God, but to put that into action in your life by repenting of your sins, because except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. To be willing to confess our faith, not to be ashamed of Jesus, because we don't want him to be ashamed of us. And then to arise and be baptized and wash away our sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If you haven't done that, you know that's good. To him who knows do good and does not do it, to him it's sin. If you are a Christian, there are good things that we as Christians should be doing and must be doing. Don't neglect to do the good that we should do. Let's show our faith. Our faith in not only the existence of Jesus as the Son of God, but to take him at his word and to trust and obey his will. If you need to respond to the invitation in any way, won't you come while we stand and while we sing?